Now bring you choir ministrations from regions, states, and nations across the world. Oh 
Shores of the Atlantic to the hills of Monrovia, a nation cries out for hope. Forgiveness goes along with freedom. It sets you free so that you are not in bondage anymore. Liberia, land of liberty, where freedom's flame burns bright. But freedom's true power lies not in our history, but in our faith. The kind of forgiveness that also brings freedom from the power of sin. Join Pastor W.F. Kumui at the GCK Crusade and experience the great escape through faith in Christ. When the grace of God comes to you, it makes you to escape the judgment coming on the earth. Featuring guest music minister, 
Jonathan White. For this global crusade with Dr. Kumue, and because of God's goodness, we're going to see breakthrough. Because of his faithfulness, we'll see breakthrough. Expect that breakthrough as Dr. Kumue speaks. Reach out and claim that breakthrough. Happening from November 28th to December 3rd, 2024 at SKD Sports Complex, Moravia, Liberia. Time, 1600 GMT daily and 700 GMT on Sunday. Join the youth for an electrifying impact session on November 30th at 7 a.m. GMT and get the key to success without limits. Join esteemed ministers and professionals on November 29th and December 2nd and 3rd by 7 a.m. GMT for a transformative session and get unlimited power for life and ministry. Come experience revitalization and equipping for effective ministry, personal growth and spiritual renewal. GCK in Liberia. Escape to Jesus. Escape to freedom. Share the hope. Invite someone. Of Satan, the gospel to every creature. GCK, gospel to every creature. Hospitality is not a substitute for holiness. Not only that, sincerity is not a substitute for salvation. Somebody says, you know, I do everything to be sincere. I try to be sincere in my life. That's good, but that's not enough nice behavior i try to behave myself i try to do the right thing when people are there when the opposite gender is there i try to carry myself in an honorable way my friend please understand that nice behavior is not a substitute for the new birth ye must be born again except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god and actually self-denial is not a substitute for sanctification without holiness no man shall see the lord that's what holiness there means sanctification it's the work of grace that god does in the heart and only god can sanctify you only God can purify you. Only God can make you holy. If you abandon God, abandon His grace, abandon faith, and then by yourself, by self-effort, I deny myself of this. Since I start coming to church, I don't drink, I don't smoke. I try to withdraw myself from anything that will not be right. Self-denial is not a substitute for sanctification. Fervency is not a substitute for faith. I'm fervent. Anything I try to do, I put my whole zeal into it. I sweat. That's all right. But sweating hard will not take you to heaven. Fervent in business, fervent in activity, it's not a substitute for faith, except you have faith in Christ. Because it says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. If you don't believe the gospel, if you don't have faith in Christ, who came to take our sins away? Are you only fervent, fervent, fervent? That's not enough. Passion. A person is passionate. Passion is not a substitute for purity of heart. Our hearts must be purified by the application of the blood of the Lamb. You know, there are some people that are naturally bold and very aggressive, and they are fearless. They fear nothing, they fear nobody. Even if it's going to bring a devastating consequence on their lives, they fear nobody and they fear nothing. But you understand, boldness is not a substitute for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But you shall receive power, real power, real boldness. After that, the Spirit of God has come upon you. If you have natural boldness, 
natural fearlessness you can dare anything you can do anything that's not a substitute for the baptism in the holy ghost and joy is not a substitute for justification there are people that they are positive anything happening in life always happy always joyful always humorous almost a plain a prank but that is not a substitute you must be justified and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary must have that justification effect in your life the grace of God helping us to do that when that trumpet shall sound thank God I will be there. Rise up and surrender yourself once again to the Lord. Present yourself once again unto the Lord. Let what we have heard, let it bear fruit in our heart, bear fruit in our home, bear fruit in our tongue, bear fruit in our action, bear fruit in everything we do, in church, at home, in the office, in the market, everywhere. Let the word of God bear the fruit of holiness in our lives. Lies. You have heard it all from our Father in the law. Pray for these Christian experiences. Pray for salvation. Pray for sanctification. Pray for Holy Ghost baptism. Hospitality is not a substitute to holiness. Pray for this experience. Hospitality is not a substitute for holiness that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man but in the power of god not your ability call upon the name of the lord call upon the name of the lord that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man but in the power of god call upon the name of the lord seek the face of god Nice behavior is not a substitute to new birth. It's not a substitute to salvation. Ye must be born again. Are you born again? Are you living a clean life? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It's your name in the book of life. Ye must be born again. Pray to God. Call upon the name of the Lord. For this glorious experience, self-denial is not a substitute for sanctification. Sanctification is the will of God for every believer. Those who are born again, sanctification is the will of God. Pray for sanctification. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, Suffer without the gate. Pray. Pray for this glorious experience. Pray that your heart be circumcised. For without holiness, no man, no man shall see the Lord. Do you want to see the Lord? Do you want to reign with Christ in eternity of joy? Call upon the name of the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I want to see the Lord. You want to see the Lord? Call upon the name of the Lord. He's ready to sanctify. He's ready to make holy. He's ready to purify as you call upon his name. Pray. And call upon the name of the Lord. Seek his face. Self-effort cannot please God. Fervency, activity, is not a substitute to faith. You must pray to God. Lord, help me to put my, my confidence in the faith of the Son of God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that 
is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Tonight, seek him diligently. Seek him with all your heart. Those who seek for him with all their heart, they receive. Tonight, you will receive. Give an experience you are, you are longing for. Salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, God will grant it unto you. Shall we pray together? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God, the charge that be given unto us to seek the face of God for these glorious experiences, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism. I pray that those who are seeking his faith tonight will receive from God of heaven in the name of Jesus. Lord God of heaven, none of us will go back home as he came to this meeting in Jesus' name. Lord, we are asking that you anoint and empower our Father and the Lord as he teaches us this night. Pray that we will receive and be blessed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for having answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Our Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for your word, the Bible, Holy Bible. Blessed instruction before leaving the earth. And we pray that the instruction you give us in your word will do good in every life in Jesus' name. And we pray that the necessary preparation that we need to put in place before we leave this world, you give us the earnestness and you give us the sincerity and you give us the spirituality that will help us to be who we ought to be as we come to you finally in Jesus' name. And we're asking that no member of our body, our tongue and other members of the body will lead the whole body to perdition and hell on a final day in Jesus' name. Be with us as we study tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. A good, good headquarters. Amen. God bless you. We're coming back to James chapter 3. And uh, we've studied already by the grace of God, chapter 1, verses 1 to 27. And we've studied chapter 2, verses 1 to 26. Now we come to chapter 3 of James. And as you look at verse 1, look at verse 1 there. It says, my brethren... Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater damnation. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, For in many things we offend. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle, to control the whole body. The Lord is uh, giving us a such light on our tongue today. The tongue is very important, very essential. What could we do? Where could we go? What progress could we make without the tongue? This little member, the tongue, very essential, very important, very indispensable. But the tongue, even though it can give us progress, what the tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. With the tongue, we get salvation. With the tongue, we come back. Like I say, I came to the Lord and he said, I am an unclean man. Then the fire touched his tongue and touched his leaves. And then he was sanctified. It's by that tongue we call upon the Lord and we tell him that we surrender, surrender all, and we're sanctified. And when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, 
we speak in other tongues, it is the tongue that expresses that other language that we pray to the Lord. It is the tongue that prays to the Lord and says, Lord, this is what I need. Are we preaching the word? Are we telling other people about the eternal life that Christ has provided for us? It is through the tongue. And yet, it is that same tongue that ruined Pharaoh. And he said, who is that God that I should obey him? It is that same tongue that ruined and destroyed Nebuchadnezzar. See, this is the Babylon I built for myself. It is the same tongue that wrecked and ruined Absalom. It is the same tongue that destroyed Ahithophel. It is the same tongue that destroyed Judas Iscariot. So, you might have on this side the tongue positive the tongue progressive the tongue prayerful and the tongue purposeful on the other hand you might use the tongue in a wrong way that makes you to pay to kind of lose all the privilege the lord will have given you in life in church as well as in heaven that's why the lord is giving us a instruction today and if we're having divine such light on our tongues, divine such light on your tongue, that tongue can promote you, that tongue can prepare you for heaven, that tongue can also derail you and destroy you and make you not to have the life on high that we need to have divine such light on our tongue. We're dividing the message today to three parts. Number one, we're looking at the characteristics of men's tongues without conversion to Christ. Those who are still natural, those who are just by themselves, they do not have the grace of God or the salvation of the Lord. They are natural men and women and we have the characteristics of man's tongue without conversion to Christ. Number two, number two is the control of mammoths, big creatures with man's a kind of a manipulating cord or cane, a little rod, a little cane, a little hem, a little instrument that man devises and uses to control great, great, big, large creatures. Number three, we're looking at the communication of our little member for commendation or for condemnation. The little member, that's the little tongue that acts like fire. And fire may do something good, fire may do something bad, little fire that kindles a great conflagration and we have the communication of a little member for either condemnation or commendation we're looking at number one number one is the characteristics of men's tongues without conversion to Christ we're looking at once again at James chapter 3 looking at verse 1 it says my brethren is talking to believers and he's talking to believers about the use of the tongue. Why? For oh, believers need to understand, you and I need to understand, your tongue can build your family. Your tongue can break your family. Your tongue can develop you. Your tongue can destroy you. Your tongue can make you progress in life. And your tongue can bring you down in life. Many of the things that we experience and that we ourselves bring upon our lives, it is the tongue that does that. That's why it says, my brethren, be not many masters, be not many teachers, be not many talkers, be not many directors, be not many people that are always talking and talking. We're not controlling our lives. We're trying to control the lives of other people. It says, 
Watch yourself, mind your business, and think about what you ought to be in life, and think about your tongue being used to make you progress in life. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we believers shall receive the greater condemnation. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, For in many things we offend all. In many things of the tongue, we offend strangers, we offend all, we offend neighbors, we offend all, we offend our husbands, we offend all, we offend our wives. In many things, with the tongue, we offend our wives, we offend all, we offend our leaders, we offend all, we offend our subordinates, we offend all. It is the tongue. If you kept quiet, if you didn't say anything, because the words that come out, they may be words of deception. They may be words of anger. They may be words of flattery. They may be words of slander. They may be words of deception that leads people in the wrong direction. Because in many things, we offend or if any man offend not in word. The same is a perfect man. If any man offend not in word, and the Spirit of God controls his heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and as is under control, under the control of the Scripture, under the control of the Sovereign Lord, under the control of the Spirit of God, if any man, by the control of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit upon his tongue, offends not in word, he, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle, control the whole body. The one who cannot control the tongue will not be able to control his mind, his direction in life. We're not be able to control his heart. We're not be able to control the body. We're not be able to control anything. He'll be like a person let loose. He's loose in word. And he's loose to the world. He's loose in word. And he's loose. You cannot control him. The wind drives him here and there. Because he offends in word. And he offends all. But... The one that is able to bridle the tongue. The one that is able to bridle the body. We're looking at three things. Look at number one. Number one is the concern for many talkers without mastery over their tongues. Number two is the, condemn, is the condemnation of misused tongues without caution or control. Number three, number three is conversation with mindful tongues, meaningful tongues consecrated to Christ. Look at number one. Number one there is talking about the concern for many talkers without mastery over the tongue. Uh, you'll see James by the Spirit is concerned Concerned for the tongue of man, the tongue of the believer, the tongue of the preacher, the tongue of the backslider, the tongue of the careless, the tongue of the prodigal. It's concerned about the tongue of everyone. That's why you find him mentioning the tongue or mentioning the speech in every chapter. Every chapter of James. Look at chapter 1. We're reading from verse 19. In chapter 1, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Slow to speak. Slow to wrath. And there are people, they pass the first part of a sentence. They have passed the first paragraph of a page. They have read the first page of a chapter. And they begin to talk. Why don't you slow down? Hear it all. No, no things that are still coming on. Be slow to speak and slow to rise. 
And there are people like David, and they, they are told the parable by Nathan. And then they are, they are wrathful. They get angry. How can somebody do that? Thou art a man. So be slow to speak and be slow to wrath. In verse 26, he tells us in verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious, if any woman among you seem to be religious, if any person among you seem to be zealous, fervent, fanatical, if any man among you, anyone among you, seem to be religious and bright, let not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. How does he deceive his own heart? I'm saved. You are deceiving yourself. If your tongue is not under your control, I am sanctified. You are deceiving yourself. If your tongue cannot be bridled, I am filled with the Holy Ghost. I am spiritual. I am high spiritually. A self-deception. If anyone does not bridle his own tongue or deceiveth his own self, this man's religion is vain, you know, it's not a crime to be quiet, rather it's a crime to be too loud and to talk all the time and a tongue wagging all the time. It tells us in chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19, chapter 2 verse 19, the believers, there is one God that does well. The devils also believe and tremble. Verse 20, in verse 20, it says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Then you talk, 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 and there's no evidence you are ever under control. Would you know that when your actions are not under control, your speech not under control, your behavior not under control, your comportment, your conduct not under control, and you are just here and there, I'm born again, I am deeper. No, you are not deeper, you are shallow. You do not have control over your life. Look at chapter 3. In chapter 3, we're looking at verse 8. It tells us in chapter 3, verse 8, it says, but the tongue and no man tame. It doesn't say God cannot tame a tongue. No man tame. The tongue, Christ can tame that tongue. The Spirit of God can tame that tongue. And the salvation of the Lord can give you self-control. But by yourself, and that's how you know the people are just coming to church. You watch them, you say, but why? Is this man acting like that? Why is this woman talking like this? You cannot uh, understand, except you understand, they don't have the controller in the heart. They don't have the redeemer in the heart. And because the one, the Lord, the authority, the sovereign that can control the heart is not there. That the reason they are the way they are because they by themselves cannot control their tongue, they cannot control their mind, they cannot control their heart, they cannot control the direction in which they go. That uh, the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Look at chapter 4. In chapter 4, he tells us in verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Speak not evil one of another. You know the people that go about, they have a story to tell. Uh, they have a war story in their lives. But they look at other people, they're delighted they can have something, a stain, a spot in the life of their neighbor to talk about. And they go about bearing tales. It says, speak not evil of one another, brethren, 
he that speaketh evil of his brother, of his sister, he that speaketh evil of his neighbor, he that speaketh evil of leaders in the church, he that speaketh evil of members in the church, judge and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law. And it says, he judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Look at chapter 5, verse 12. In chapter 5, verse 12, it says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not at all. There are people swearing is too close too near to their mouth and they mention the name of God and take the name of God in vain have you done this little thing minor thing yes I did or yes I've not done it I'm thinking of doing it I'm planning or doing it but immediately they swear to God and Jesus said, don't swear. And these people, church people, church goers, church commons, members of a denomination, members of a so-called church, they swear and swear and swear above, above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by heaven any other oath but let your yea be yea if you're a child of God I'm going there then you go there let your yes be yes let your nay be nay because whatsoever lets ye fall into condemnation look at number two here number two here we're looking at the condemnation of misused tongues without control or without caution or control. Hey, let's come back to verse 1. In verse 1 it says, my brethren, my brethren, are you born again? We have the same family, my brethren. Are you born again and the grace of God has taken effect in your life? My brethren, if you are a brother, if you are a sister, you do unto me as you expect me to do unto you. If you are a member of the family of God, you do unto her as you want her to do unto you. And that will put a check on our tongue. That will put caution, that will put control because I wouldn't want him to talk to me like that. Not just the word, not just the word, not just the tongue, the temper that comes with that word. Not just uh, the temper, the thought that is behind that word. When you talk to the other person, before you talk, understand, he's my brother, she is my sister. And because we're members of the same family, we want to check and control what we say. It says, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Because God is a silent listener to every conversation. Everything we say, and the words that come out, he knows the thought behind the words. He knows the purpose, the plan, the plot. He knows the hatred at the root of the words that we speak. That is why he says, be not many masters. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, for in many things we offend all. Uh, have you looked at how you lost some important friends? And the fellow said, well, I tried to be a friend to him. I tried to be a friend to her. But 
Our words always cut down. It cuts from above, it cuts from beneath. It wants to make him ha, become like a stone. When you cut the branches and you cut the roots. And because of that, because we offend in many worlds, because we offend, we break our families. Because we offend, we make other people feel this is not a compatible person to live with, to stay with, because of the offense of the world. And then he tells us, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, if any man offend not in word, the people that have studied I will speak, a conversation, everything. They say that men speak 25,000 words every day. And when you put all that together, in one week, you can write a volume, a big volume of a book. When you put that together in a month, 25,000 words in a day. And it says, you know, those who have done their study, they said women speak 30 thousand words in a day you know you wake up in the morning there are things to say and there are things to say to yourself self-talk the things to say to people around you that will spoil their day and before you even go out at all you knock that down with your word you knock the other fellow with your word and then you go after you've gone you're still remembering what you said. You spoiled their day. You spoiled their mind. And they're thinking, how, how can a woman, how can a man say this early in the morning to somebody while you're happy and while you're kind of, you know, planning, I'll do this, I'll do that. Then he brings the word. You are down. And then... You go to the office, you, and of the, in the office there you speak and speak and speak, and as you come back from the office, conversation begins again. You just feel the discomfort of quietness. You cannot be quiet. We need to be quiet. Think about your life. Think about the future. Think about your progress and think about the things you've lost. Think about your spiritual life and think about the changes that ought to be made. If you thought about that, you will not feel any discomfort where there is quietness. But it says, it we offend on if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, is a matured man, is a complete man, is a thoughtful man, is a purposeful man, the one that offends not in word. Now, what do I gain? To talk to him and make him angry. When you think like that, you're a thoughtful man, you're a matured man, you're a perfect man. What? It's going to be the result. I should build him up. I should build the family up. I should encourage this young fellow. And I should make his life positive. Now, that's being thoughtful. That's being perfect. That's being matured. But when we speak, as we throw words, as we throw stones at people, now, what do I gain? If I pick up stones and all the houses around in the neighborhood, I break their windows with stones. Throw it there, throw it there, throw it there. Anywhere you are going, you see any stone, look at a stone, spare stone there. You pick it up and throw. What do you gain? Look at all the people around you. The stone of words that will pick up and throw here, shatter his window, throw there, destroy a door, throw it there and control and destroy their temper. They, they become destabilized by the things, by the words we throw. He said that will not be right. He says if we're mature, if we're thoughtful, if we're purposeful, 
or not be throwing things all around like that in romans chapter 2 reading there from verse 20 romans chapter 2 reading from verse 20 it says an instructor of the foolish a teacher of babes which has the form of knowledge and uh, of the truth of the Lord. Look at verse 21. It says in verse 21, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest not thou thyself. Isn't that where to begin? When you teach yourself, that word you are so eager to, you know, push out and send out, swallow that word. Meditate on that word. Think of that word. Apply that word to your own life. Thou that instructs others, don't you instruct yourself? Thou that teaches others, don't you teach yourself? Thou that wants to control others, why do you want to control somebody's life? It's like, you know, uh, you want to control a driver. Do you know where he's going? You want to control the driver. Do you know his destination? You want to control the driver. Do you know his plan? You, when you want to control other people's lives, do you know their purpose in life? Do you know where they want to go? Do you know their plan for the day? Do you know their consecration and commitment? Here is what God has called them to do, and they want to do that. But the fellow that does not know the internal working in the life of a man, internal working in the life of a woman, and wants to control with words, you see somebody very quiet, very thoughtful, very meditative, and you feel the discomfort of his quietness. The man is thinking about his deficiency. He's thinking about his life. He's thinking about what he needs to repent of. He's thinking about how to make his way right with God. He's thinking about the effect of the word he has had upon his life. And then you burst in. And you're too quiet. What's happening? And then you disturb his way of thinking. And the conviction on him fades up. And before he regains his calm again, before he regains his thoughtful process again, it takes a long time. Why don't you leave people alone and let them direct their lives and let them think about their future and let them think about how to make their ways right with God. Teach yourself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Does thou steal? Look at verse 22. In verse 22, thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery. You say, you say, you say, you know too much of what other people should do, what other people should be, what they should not do, and what they should do. You know too much about how to help other people to get to heaven. And you're too quick, but you never think about yourself. That that says a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit, dost thou abhorrest, thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You talk and talk and talk. You're too much of a teacher, but you are not much about a thoughtful person about a meditative person and you also go to talk and talk and talk and teach and teach and teach and instruct and instruct and instruct teach yourself apply the word to your life for that is what will make you make progress on the way to heaven in ezekiel chapter 13 
reading from verse 22. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22, it tells us, it says, Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad. With lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad. Look at that righteous person. He's minding his own business. He's going in the path of rectitude. He's going in the path of purity. And while it's like that, you, you concoct a lie, deception. And you throw it at him. And you tell him something that will jolt him. And then it says, you make the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and uh, you strengthen, strengthen the hands of the wicked, that I, sh that he should not return from his wickedness, from his wicked way, and you are promising him life. You know, somebody is uh, crying. Why are you crying? became careless as a girl, as a lady, and um, mommy in the Lord, I need to tell you, now I am pregnant. What do you think, what do you talk about? Repentance. What do you talk about? Checking her life and standing to become straight, but that sinner, oh, you see, is that why you are crying? You, can't, you never can tell what that baby will become. Forget about what you have done. Forget about your guilt. Uh -uh. She should not forget about her guilt. She should not forget about the need to repent. I and mean, then you cheer her up. You don't know. She might become a doctor. She might become a president. Wait, hold on. Even if that baby becomes the president of a country, so I, adultery is adultery. Fornication is fornication. And if that lady that gives birth to a president does not repent, she spends eternity on the other side. So uh, we should not just be you know, telling people this and telling people that, we bring them to the point of repentance. Look at number three here. Number three here in the conversation with mindful tongues. That means that you are consecrated to Christ. Christ has saved us. And because Christ has saved us, we want to follow in his steps. What will Christ say? What will Christ teach? How will Christ talk? What contribution will Christ make to this conversation? It is that consecration to Christ that makes us to set our conversation aright. Look at James chapter 3, the second part of verse 2. The second part of verse 2, it says... He, the one that does not offend the world, he will, the same, is a perfect man, is a matured man, is a well-controlled contro man, is a thoughtful man, and is able also to bridle the whole body. When your words don't have any control, and you talk and talk and talk, and you talk beyond the level of grace. And there is no grace in your speech anymore. It means you've gone astray and you lead other people astray. We're looking at Psalm 50 verse 23. Psalm 50 verse 23, it says, Whoso order offereth praise. Purifieth me, that God talking to us, and to him that ordereth his speech, his conversation. You order the conversation. 
You want to throw out an arrow and you order it. You have a target. You have a point you want to reach. You order, just like a public speaker. A public speaker will order, will arrange, will organize what he wants to say because he has a target. A private speaker will think before he speaks. A private speaker will look before he leaves. He would say, now I want to talk to my neighbor. I want to talk to my friend. I want to talk to my husband. I want to talk to my wife. You order your conversation. When I say this to him, when I say this to her, what do I intend it will produce in his life? From a member to another member, from a minister to the member, from the member to the minister, you order your conversation, you order your speech, you order the things you say so that it will bring something good. He that authorizes this conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. A good, good headquarters say amen. First Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. First Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 10. It says, for he that will love life and see good days, he that will love life and see good days, what does that mean? Life happy. Life joyful. Life exciting. Life progressing. He that will see good days and have love life, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Because that thing is like a boomerang. If you throw it out, it comes back to you. You bring sadness, you bring sorrow, you bring unhappiness, and you bring uh, you know, depression in the lives of other people. It will come back to you. What we sow is what we reap every time. In fact, what we reap is greater, higher, more devastating than what we sow. You sow the wind, and then you reap the whirlwind. That is the reason why you're very thoughtful. I can't talk like that to her. Maybe she merits it. Maybe she invited that. But I can't talk like that. Because if I talk like that, it will come back as boomerang. It will destroy my own life. And it will show that as she is, so I am. Be evil. If I throw the word back to her, I am evil too. Is she undisciplined, indecent? If I throw the words back to her, I become undisciplined myself. Is she evil? If I pick up that and throw it back to her, I become evil myself. That's the reason why it says, He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from that they speak no girl. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, Let him eschew evil, resist evil, Deny evil, blot out evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it and ensure it. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord 
is against them that do evil, against them that talk evil, against them that shout evil on mountain tops. Look at a uh, number, uh, the next number here, the control of mammoth creatures with mass manipulating cord or cane, manipulating instrument. And that's why he tells us in James chapter 3, and in verse 3, behold, we put beads in the horse's mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, Behold also the sheep, which though they be so big and so great and so massive and they are driven with fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small hem. A very small rod, a very small cord, a very small cane, whither, whithersoever the governor, the master, the director directs it. He's saying that, you know, when you go to the zoo, you see lions being tamed, the elephants being tamed, and you see big whales being directed by some small, small conditioning instrument. And yet, we're coming to number three here. Number three, it tells us, number three now, it, it says in uh, number three, the directing force of a little instrument. The directing force of a little instrument, the little instrument we have that then gives us the, uh, the control over the big, big things. It tells us uh, the directing force of a little instrument. We're looking at James chapter 3, and James chapter 3, we're looking at at verse 5. In verse 5, here it tells us in verse 5, it says, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasted great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindled. Life, though very big and though very serious, yet, there is that little member that controls everything. It's um, number 3, verse, that's uh, James chapter 3, verse 5. James chapter 3, we're looking at verses 5 and 6. James chapter 3, reading from verses 5 and 6. In verse 5, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindled. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. And then it says that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the cause of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. In this section, we're looking at the um, we're looking at the communication of our little member for either condemnation or commendation. Number one is the danger of 
the little tongue as a little fire. The danger of a little tongue as a little fire. Number two is the damnation of loose tongues in lasting fire. Number three, in number three, we have the dynamite in liberated tongues with lightning fire. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the danger of the little tongue as a little fire. We read that verse five already. And look at Psalm 12. And we're reading from verse uh, two, Psalm 12, reading from verse 2, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering leaves, and with uh, a double heart, do they speak? Look at verse 3, in verse 3 it says, uh, the Lord shall cut off all flattering leaves. Not some, all flattering lips. You know, somebody is uh, doing something uh, uh, wrong, but you are expecting to get something, a profit, maybe money, maybe some material things from him or from her. And she is doing something naughty. He is doing something damnable. And uh, then he says, ah, my friend, what do you think of this? Oh, you are so great. You are so wonderful. You are whatever I can think about. You are just good. But you know in your heart, this is a sinful man. And this is an evil woman. But because you want something, you flatter him, you flatter her. The Lord God says the Lord himself shall cut off the flattering leaves. You're saying something about somebody, and you know the fellow is there. You really know that that man, that woman needs to repent and needs to turn around, but I wouldn't allow him or allow her to hear from me that, you know, uh, it will look like I'm judging him, judging her. And you flatter him, and you flatter her. You're nice. You're good. You are great. You're the best person I ever interacted with. Ah, but that's flattery. And you know, you don't believe that in your heart. The Lord himself shall cut off all flattering leaves and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, Who have said with our tongue, we will prevail. He used the tongue as a weapon to conquer. Conquer people, crush people, destroy people. My tongue is mine, and with my tongue, I will prevail. And then it says, who is Lord over us? Well, if you are born again, Christ is Lord over you. The real child of God, Christ is Lord over you. If Christ is Lord over you, is Lord over your tongue, is Lord over your eyes. Watch what you see. Is Lord over your ears. You watch what you hear. Is Lord over your plans. Is Lord over every influence in your life. It tells us in uh, Proverbs chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 18. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 18, as a mad man who casteth fire brands and arrows and death. Look at verse 19. So is the man that deceiveth is neighbor and saith am not I in sport a mad man is not in control of his senses 
is not in control of his utterance. Is not in control of his real life, the center of his life. As a madman that throws fire 